Podcast Podcast. My name is Evan Kunai, if you didn't know, and I am here with Christopher Ritter. What is up? We are your hosts of the Mock Stars Podcast, the number one podcast on the internet for, you guessed it, Magic the Gathering and Dr. Pepper. If you'd like to support the show, you can do so by finding us on YouTube, where if you're watching right now, you can see my sweet Michael Jordan number 45 jersey. You can also find us on all major podcasting platforms where you can leave us a five-star review. It goes a long way to helping new people find the show. You can also join our Discord server where we're having conversations about CDH. We just hosted a couple of games on the server the other day, so we're starting to get that ball rolling. You can also support us on Patreon where you can be a supporter of the show. For $3 a month, you become an official Pepperhead. And by becoming a Pepperhead, you get access to... Individual deck reviews by the Mock Stars, and you get access to the Dr. Pepper channel where we talk about the deepest of deep lores with Dr. Pepper. And uh, that's that's all the ways I think. Uh, you can also just reach out to us and say, "Hey, you're awesome." That's another way to support the show. It's nice to be nice sometimes, yeah. just for no reason. Exactly. Thank you. And uh, Ritter, how'd you how'd you feel about the uh, Dr. Pepper shout out there? Was it was it did I give it, like, do it justice? I mean, I, I feel like you'd be more enthusiastic for Dr. Pepper. Right. Uh, we could all be more enthusiastic for Dr. Pepper. There is no upper limit to enthusiasm for Dr. Pepper. But I, you gave it the minimum credit that it's due, I think. Right now, I will raise the ceiling next time, or I'll try to meet the ceiling of what is expected next time. So on next week's episode, you can expect a higher energy, a higher level of energy in regards to Dr. Pepper. On today's show, we are talking about the top cards from Murders at Karlov Manor. I I want to say Markov Manor every single time. And I don't know if that's like just the alliteration that I want to hear in my brain. But I feel like they missed something. They could have had it at Edgar Markov's like... Oh, that's Innistrad. Sorry. Never mind. Completely different plane of existence. <laughs> Karlov Manor. <laughs> yeah. Karlov, Karlov Manor. A different... It's a lot of the same letters and, like, sounds, uh, just in a different order. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. It, it just rolls off the tongue a little bit easier. But we're talking about the top cards from Murders at Karlov Manor. But before we get into that, we're just going to follow up on this secret layer drama that continues to unfold. Last week, if you missed last week's episode, we talked about the change in sale structure for secret layer, which ultimately means that it is a before secret layer used to be that it was printed to demand and it was available for a limited window of time and it, these cards would never be printed again. The limited window and the cards never being printed again that part hasn't changed, but it is no longer being printed to demand. It is a limited number of cards being printed and sold to capitalize on the FOMO that we all feel and to capitalize on this, well, addiction that we all have. It is called Cardboard Crack for a reason. Now, to follow up on that, the 2024 Winter Super Drop came out, and there are, well plenty of spicy cards to be had here it is one of if i have to say it one of the more boring super drops that i've seen in a while because they're i mean there, there's some interesting stuff for like your personal commanders if you want like you know there's there's the just add milk stuff so if you play uh Krark sakashima like you're gonna want to get that yeah like there's some stuff but it's not super meaty this time i would say there's no there's nothing that's uh for me, an obvious, like, hey, I definitely want to get this. Right. Yeah. It's it, like they, by doing that second helpings, like the Just Add Milk cereal box style again, they acknowledge how successful the first one was, which was great. I thought that one was like awesome. But now by with the cards they've included, they are acknowledging that, hey, Clark and Sakashima, this industry with like competitive cd or like with cdh is growing and so we want to acknowledge that and get those players to involved in buying those cards adrix adrix and nev is notably rising in price so hey another popular commander can we get that on like on a cereal box and then for the memes we have yargle 
which gotta have Yargle for the memes. Gotta. And gotta. they're good, they're good memes. They're yeah. quality memes. Yeah. You know, and some of those Yargle cards are hella expensive. So someone is out there, there is a market for it, and they're just continually to get, continuing to tap into that. What I have to say about this is one, they're including the final of the three uh Amon Ket, you know, Hour of Devastation gods. You can get the Scorpion God as a promo for it if you purchase select bundles. Uh, so it's notably the Scarab God, which I figured would have been the most expensive one, the people that would want it the most, is only going for about $14 at, in the secondary market. DJ, that's DJ Scarab God. And then you have the Locust God, which just came out with the last one, and that is going for less than five dollars. <laughs> so, and then Oof. you have the Scorpion God, which is the least played out of all of them. I imagine this is going to be like a five dollar card, maybe less. So, there's not really any reason to not go a up. huge incentive to spend a couple hundred dollars on this stuff, right? You, yeah, the minimum package that you'd have to purchase is a hundred and thirty dollars. So. If you want to spend $130 to get a $5 promo card, be Wizards of the Coast guest. They would love if you did that. Play right into their trap. Yep. And so this drop went live four days ago, three or four days ago. At the time that you're going to be hearing this, I think it's five, five days. So five days ago at the time that you're hearing this, and there is not a single drop that is sold out. Even though they've decided to have a limited stock, there's not a single one that's sold out, which tells you so that... So do, do you think they're lying about the limited stock, or do you think it's a lack of enthusiasm? Well, I think that was the reason that the sales of Secret Layer were dipping in the first place, is they might put one card that anybody wants in a single drop, and so that person says, I will spend the $20 to get a copy of that, versus the $40 to get the whole drop and just save myself some money. Like the value of the other cards means nothing to me. So like that was, it's ultimately the card selection that they've made here, you know, in revealing this. Like I think the Beauty of the Beasts drop with uh, Serpent of the Yawning Depths and Felidar Guardian is probably my favorite one, but it's only, I would only want the Felidar Guardian. Is that just aesthetically though? too because like the value is not necessarily there no yeah it's just aesthetic for me so like yeah i I mean that eternal witness is is sweet uh i I don't know if i would even play it though right there there i mean yeah there are a few decks that like now that we've dabbled more in like higher power and stuff like that there's a lot well no no i I mean the eternal witness like even if i'm gonna play eternal witness i don't know if i'm gonna play that copy even though aesthetically i like the look of the drop yeah, like yeah. Like the deceptive divination, I like the look of all of them, but I don't know if I would play any of them. Yeah, even if right. I was play that card. You don't you know? even. It doesn't even look like a creature in any way. Yeah, that's my problem there. Yeah. Like you know, there has to be some sort of like connective symbology between you know the aesthetics of the card and what the card does, and I think we've talked about that in different ways too. Where like with the stuff in the uh, holiday collectors Lord of the Rings stuff, like where the text on like Arwen and Aragorn were just like all over the card. Like, oh, dude. Yeah, yeah. Like they're impossible to read. I so when I was on uh, Moxfield, I like sort of like bougieing out my deck and putting whatever version. And in the Indoraptor video, which you haven't seen, it's I'll put a link down in the description below. I in the list I put Mount Doom. And I went to put the like psychedelic Mountain Doom in there, and then I was mistaking it for a sorcery or an instant every time I would pick it up. Like yeah, every and time it's I draw, gonna be a card too. Like you're gonna misplay it. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna a, a line of text will be in a spot it's not normally at, and it's relevant to what you're doing or what you should be doing or it, putting your finger in on something happening on the stack and you're just not going to see it because the card is all fakakta. Yeah, yes. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. <laughs> the yeah, the thing is is that we've wondered how far they can take it to, you know, like uh warp and shape these cards to include all the text but in in creative ways, sure, but at what point does it 
go beyond like like you said missing like relevant lines of text and misplaying the card because the text is in an unexpected place or it's too distracting yep. or it's whatever it's poorly designed yeah. These hard-boiled thrillers, uh, thankfully, they're not cards that anyone's going to be playing in their competitive deck because they're all just truly impossible to read. They're super oblique yes, in terms I, of like figuring out what the card, you know, where the relevant text is. Yeah, when they did when they did this with the Blasphemous Act and a few a few other cards with like Dismember and stuff, those ones were were fine. Like I felt like that was as extreme as I was willing to go for a secret layer, and now we yeah, have yeah maybe the... maybe those cards work when it's one line of text that is an uncomplicated line of text right and now there's dire undercurrents lots of text you know yeah Jace lots of text so yeah there I you'd think that by now they'd have it figured out unfortunately yeah the change in sales model is not going to push these any faster i think they're going to learn very quickly that these will be at least a few of these will still be available at the end of the 25 days and 8 hours that i that they currently have left so maybe they'll be like you know what maybe it's the quality of cards that we're choosing that's determining the level of sales Crazy thought. Who knows, who, who knows? Yeah, yeah. Just make it all make sense. Like, make one drop make sense. Like, I think the Krakashima is like the beginning of that, where they realize, hey, these two cards just go together. They're going to go in a, in a drop together. And, like, the design will be cohesive. But they also, you know, like, I wish they'd put another Krakashima-based card in that as well. So, regardless, we're moving on. This has been your weekly update with Secret Lair. It's still a sad environment. <laughs> but we're talking about the best cards in Murders at Karlov Manor. The set that is now available to be had in your hands as of today. Even though there's a lot of confusion on what pre-release means now, this is the official release day. It is also available on Arena. I did a draft the other day and it went horribly absolutely awful oh okay did you do your usual you're like ah, i can i can make a four color deck here at <laughs> no no, <laughs> no, no. Or, okay <laughs> no i built a three color i went just guy detectives so the deck like when i looked at it on paper it looked really good i'm by the way just so we're not like thinking that I'm getting mixed up into like diamond or like ranking or anything like that. I'm in silver. I'm in silver. Like, cause I just started doing these drafts and I, uh, I drafted my deck and I got two board wipes, which I was like, awesome. Oh yeah. Like sweet. I can play a control variant, you know, control list. And, um, I had two crime novelists and a bunch of investigate cause I'm playing detectives. So, like, I figured the synergy in this deck is kind of banging. Like, looks really good. I got wiped every single game by, like, multiple mythics in each game. And just, I went 0-3. And, and I was salty as fuck, bro. Like, I was so upset. And then you get what well, you get a pack and 50 gems for going 0 and 3 by the way just so all the the people out there who are listening to this that's what you get if you draft on arena and you play like ass or the rng rng jesus is not in your favor like you get a pack of cards and 50 gems so i open the pack of cards i realized that the board wife that i had gotten in the draft was ass it's the ill timed explosives or something like that so two and two a blue and a red, you can draw two cards, then discard two cards, and you deal X damage to each creature where X is the greatest mana value of cards discarded this way. So you have a way to like filter the damage so it doesn't wipe your board, but kills you know a majority of your opponent's it's, it's creatures. It's a super conditional wipe. I, I mean, removal is great in limited um, or draft, uh, but a board wipe, not necessarily, right? Yeah, it, it's. I think you were, were you were overvaluing uh, how good a board white would be, and then it's also super conditional. I will say that um, 
the times that I did get to play it, it was useful because I was behind. Like that's how fast all these other decks were. So I was able to like build up the mana, you know, and once they used their removal on the creature that I had placed down on like turn two or three, then on turn four, I could wipe their three creatures and then reestablish myself. So it allowed me to control the scenario in like some ways, but um, I don't know why it just, ne- the whole deck just sort of like, I kept getting flooded and I play 15 lands and I no rocks and no way to mm-hmm. filter the mana. And I just kept getting flooded with lands. And I was just like, you got to be kidding me. I need like, I need anything other than a land. I have six lands already. What is going on with this deck? And I draw two more lands in a row and it would just be like, what is going on? But um, that's not to say that this set is a bad draft environment. I just got my ass beat and it didn't feel good. It wasn't fun. But uh, I opened that pack at the end of it and I'm like, please let this be a good card that I can use in the future. And it was another one of the stupid fucking board wipes that I was playing. Uh, it's a bummer. <laughs> I, was like, <laughs> I was like, I'm so done. I'm so done. Oh my god! I I turned off arena after that, and I was like, "Just that's enough for today." Got to take a breather. Yeah, take yep. some time away from it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. God, the adventures of Evan on arena is just oh, could go on, could go on. Let's get into the main topic. Top cards. I would say number one is a card that everyone has been talking about. This and card is you are. Ga- Oh, go ahead. Are you saying number one in terms of the first one we're talking about, or you're saying this is the best card in the set? I think it's a little bit of both, but it's up for okay. debate. All uh, right. Yeah, I think we're just going to... No have... suspense. We're just going right for it. Yes. No suspense. Okay. The average watch time on our podcast is 17 minutes, so we got to get this one in right now. Otherwise, people Under are going to Under the wire. Out. Yep. So, got it. Uh, first, we're talking about Delny Streetwise Lookout. It's Mini Mom. Two white. Two and a white, legendary creature, human scout, 2-2. Two, two. Creatures you control with power 2 or less can't be blocked by creatures power 3 or greater. Not the part you were referring to. The part you were referring to is the second block of text. If an ability of a creature you control with power 2 or less triggers, that ability triggers an additional time. Minimum. Wow. It does things. This is, uh, well, it's a card. And we've always said that doubling effects is lazy design. They've just sort of uh funneled it a little bit here now notably this is a jeweled lotus away i think we'll see some people try to take this as like uh play this as a commander which is cool but- yeah it's definitely like a viable it seems like a viable weenie commander because like listen you can cast it turn one and then it's got two relevant things going on in in white mm-hmm. which is relevant into both these abilities uh and to weenies uh your creatures power two or less they're unblockable by creatures power three or greater so you can go wide right you can right. you can win through combat or the second line you know those same creatures every time an ability triggers that build ability triggers triggers in a double uh, an additional time so you have the doubling effect where you can get into combo lines and things like that so it, it is definitely real sweet in the command zone um how viable do you think it is i well as far as being in the command zone not very viable there are some like cards that are like that interact with it and i think that you can build a strategy around it Mm -hmm. Uh, but mono white well it's funny that a lot of the cards we'll be talking about today are either mono white or uh contribute to white strategies but um i would say that like things like skyclave apparition is a 2-2. So you get double triggers there, which is amazing. And like that's ultimately one of the best cards. I think that is just one of the best cards in Mother Machines. If you like Elishnorn, if you decide to build that as your commander. So you get a little bit of a lower ceiling and you still get all these like effects. You still get uh like why am I spacing on this right now? It's the flash whenever your opponent searches their library, you draw a card and gain a life archivist of agma there it is you also get two triggers with that so there are plenty of cards out there that are going to synergize with this now in other colors we've seen 
Wizards of the Coast start to like ramp up what you get for two mana. So like for one in a red, you got a uh, belligerent yearling, which is a three, two with trample with only upside. And, you know, like you even see with Anzrog, the quake mole, it's like for four mana, you get an eight, four that has only upside. And white is still sort of in this range of, Hey, if you spend two mana, you get a two, two. So there's like, I think there's a lot of room here to play with Delny as a commander, but ultimately I think it, is better in the 99 because there's one card that you want to be able to include in your deck list if you're playing white and red and that's dockside and it double triggers dockside so it makes a lot of loops a lot easier with delny hello yeah <laughs> <laughs> no, you're good. I uh, was just pausing for dramatic effect. The, got it. Yeah. Because uh, everyone knows that, oh, my God, Dockside loops. You wouldn't. We wouldn't be talking about anything if it didn't somehow contribute to the power of Dockside in, uh, in some way or another. I know that Justin Tordeth from uh, the Discord server has been s- stating that this is going to go into his Rocco build. And because it allows you to double up on triggers that you search for from Rocco and okay. like, and it allows you to put multiple win conditions on the stack at the same time. So a lot, hey, okay. There yeah, we go. a lot harder to interact with in a, like uh, when you're putting double triggers, you know, it's like, which one do I deal with? You know, it's like, well, you gotta have, there aren't a whole lot of abilities to make, be able to deal with both because now you have something to battle the tide binder which a lot of five color mid range decks are starting to f- like use as a utility piece to stop get it, to stop players from getting, you know, a dockside trigger or to get um, like dual caster mage trigger or something something like that. But this is like, no, you're gonna get two of those triggers, uh, which is yeah notable there. Dual caster mage also doubles up on that trigger, and there's just so much that this card likes to include under this little umbrella. We're still figuring out how many like how many things this is going to interact with so the ceiling super high the floor also super high so well i you know i I think what we learned with like talion kindly lord and uh i think there's another card where we learned that uh two or less is a big segment of the cards being played in cdh yes like whether you're dealing with two or less power, two or less toughness, two or less CMC. I mean, that's the big one, the CMC, but two or less power, a lot of the value creatures that you see in decks fit that, you know? Yeah. All right. It is it is a, a conversation we could probably have an entire episode on had we, I, I you know, you could probably compile a list of creatures that it does enable and, and exp, like expand on that. But we have many more cards to talk about. Well, not many, but we have more cards to talk about. The first, or the second, is Doorkeeper Thrall. Ritter, you want to take it away? Uh, Yeah, so uh, one and a white creature Thrall. It's a one-two flash flying. Artifacts and creatures entering the battlefield don't cause abilities to trigger. Wah, wah, wee, wah. This one's also crazy. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's great. It's, uh, man... Uh, turning off ETBs on artifacts and creatures is huge. Like that is the bread and butter of many deck strategies. Totally. And it means that what you're doing is probably playing a stacks focused strategy, including this in your list, because if you are, there's just so many things that this nombos with. I've, I've known a lot of, like a lot of players in the Naya CDH discord are talking about having this pretty much in every list that exists. And I don't know if I totally agree with that. A lot of lists want to be able to stop. Like the notable thing that this stops is one ring. The one ring trigger of giving a player protection stops it. So uh, you can shut that off. You can also shut off, like we said, Dockside. Nope, that pretty much everything that we're going to, uh, these top two cards are ones that interact with Dockside in two different unique ways. But that's because... It enables so much, and so you either have to stand in its way or you have to enable it even more. Doorkeeper Thrall does 
way too much because its body is also a one two with flying one two flying yep. yep so it does even more than just that static effect it allows you to have evasion to get through so uh timna probably wants this card i think that uh, there is potential to have it in there if you want to keep the game under control in your favor doorkeeper throw can help you do that even though you know, and then you just find a way to either bounce it or remove it when the time is necessary. You're going to be drawing so many cards that you're likely going to have interaction, even if it does mean that you're bouncing a doorkeeper thrall back to your hand. Um, like Chain of Vapor, for for example. Uh, I've seen too many people bounce their own things with Chain of Vapor to think that that isn't a viable option for a blue farm deck that wants to include this in their list. I think that this is going to be heavily played right out the gates it uh yeah no it's it's super versatile like you know every part of the card's good yeah yeah it yeah. it's gonna dodge bow masters like at least that etb trigger so it can't get sniped and uh as long as your opponents aren't drawing multiple cards in a single you know swoop this thing is probably going to survive the Bowmaster onslaught or at least for a little while I would say that it will fall off in the future as this in the same way. Well, not in the same way, because I, I would say that uh, Hushbringer has been the card to play. If you're like in this, I think just one ups Hushbringer in a way. So so you think there's going to be a better version of this eventually? I, <laughs> yes, yes, there will be a better version of this. They'll make a one mana artifact or enchantment that has complete evasion that totally shuts stuff like this down. So, uh, like Hushbringer's great, it uh, but it just it stops a different thing. It it stops creatures and it stops like death triggers, so like things dying. Where this is like artifacts and creatures entering don't trigger. It's different in that way. Also, Hushbringer doesn't have flash. This has flash, and we know that interacting instant speed is the most valuable thing if you're playing at a high level. If you're playing this at a casual table, it's probably not going to do much. Like, yeah, you don't really need a lot of trickery at uh, at low levels. <laughs> yeah, and if you do play trickery at low levels, you're probably shame gonna, on you. Yeah, you're probably going to get some salt at the table, warranted or not. It just happens, and it's sad, but people get upset. Number three, third card in our conversation today. Pick your poison. Ritter, you want to take it away on that one? Uh, no, I don't have that card in front of me. What color is that? It is mono, or it is green. It is one green mana sorcery. It says choose one. Uh, each opponent sacrifices an artifact. Each opponent sacrifices an enchantment. Or each opponent sacrifices a creature with flying. It uh. is... Yeah. It is really good. And while... I, I don't I, like that it's a sorcery. You said it's a sorcery. I'm still looking for it. Oh, here it yeah, is. Yeah. yeah. It's a sorcery, but not unplayable. I No, I mean it's good because, you know, all three modes are relevant and it hits all three opponents. Like I don't know if you're gonna hit three out of three opponents for whatever mode you're gonna choose, but you're probably gonna hit two out of three with whatever mode you choose. Totally. Like there are things that are gonna be like the choices here are, I think there just offers enough utility here where you say like each opponent sacrifices an enchantment and then you're probably hitting a Rhystic Study and then if you're playing against me, you're probably hitting a Wild Growth. But mm -hmm. if you say each opponent sacrifices an artifact, you might be hitting a Mana Crypt or a Soul Ring or, you know, the worst thing you could probably hit is a Clue or a Food, but, you know, you still get something off the board. And then each opponent sacrifices a Creature with Flying this is a Chrom killer. This is a doorkeeper mm -hmm. throw killer. This can hit a lot of different things. It can kill it like you can hit a Gilded Drake that has been exchanged already. There's just like I think there's a versatility here that uh offers removal for Ristic Studies and Mr. Cremoras mm -hmm. that uh you know it you've... not being an instant hurts it. Mm -hmm. Uh but yeah, definitely definitely versatile. I think another card that we talk about also in green um arch druid's charm uh three green uh instant mm -hmm. and same idea 
Choose one, search your library for a creature or land card and reveal it. Put it onto the battlefield if it's land. Otherwise, put it into your hand, then shuffle. Put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature you control. It deals damage equal to its power to target creature you don't control. Or third mode, exile target artifact or enchantment. Um, I think that maybe this one is the one we're more likely to see at high level tables, even if it's going to be restricted to like mono green or like green two color builds. Yeah, this is like that one. Art like the Arc Druid's charm is going to be definitely. It's going to be played, but it has to be a very particular strategy. I feel like. Uh, yeah, the three green play. mana hurts it. Yeah, and you know it's not like uh, I don't know, like uh, something with three colored pips like Necropotence, where it's like you're getting something incredible for your investment <laughs> yes. in three of the same color pip. Arc Druid's charm is something really, really, really good. Um, but you're not going to go out of your way to make sure you have the mana base to support it. Yeah, right. Because like it's really that's great that you actually lined it up next to Necropotence because that is what like level of power you need in order to be like considered a high powered like uh, relevant card that is going to see play in non generic or in, in more generic builds, not like just yeah walking like down this very particular line of strategy where the, the Arc Druid's Charm is like, I want to play it in Zakama because it goes and gets Shiv and Gorge, which wins the game. So if I'm able to mm -hmm. draw my library or draw into it or have it in hand, I can cast it out, go get the Shiv and Gorge, go through my loop, and that ends the game. I see the potential there. I see it also as removal, and I also see it as a way to get rid of the One Ring, and yep. which is just, I think that if a card can say, hey, I deal with the one ring. You start considering it in more, uh, more heavily for certain builds. Yeah, or you know, enchantments are relevant too. You might want to get rid of a Rhystic Study or a Mystic Remora. You know. Yeah, and there, like, there aren't many things that are indestructible or require exiling them. But there are ways, to, like, recycle things. Like, uh, just this last week, I played a game where I Savine's Reclamation, my Rhystic Study, back to the board, where you know what. Wouldn't have had that opportunity had the Arc Druid's Charm been the been the option. So mm -hmm. there there are ways to like definitely uh, reduce the number of cards that go into the graveyard with this. And uh, I guess go back to pick your poison is that this also says I deal with the One Ring, but in if you're playing it at early enough in the game, the way they got to the One Ring is through artifact ramp in some way. They're just going to sacrifice whatever else they used to get there. So. Um, it is, I think that it being a sorcery for one mana is fine because we see this same effect, but much more narrow with like, uh, natural, not like nat naturalize is like destroy whatever, blah, blah, blah at instant speed. But this is like each opponent, you know, does everything. You have the potential to hit three other players for one green mana that could set them back enough to give you an advantage. Mm -hmm. so that that you know something gets swan songed hey i'm gonna kill a crom and that freaking bird so you have you have a, a few options that's uh that's why i figured it was good to talk about it it's two it, good cards to talk about together depending on you know which one is more relevant to you depends on your deck i think but both are gonna see play right and i think we still favor we obviously favor force of vigor over this because well, oh, for sure. Yeah. You don't spend any mana and you just, you know, it, it's free to cast at instant speed. So there's free spells at a baseline are pretty good. Yeah. You're running both. You're not just like slotting Force of Vigor out for this. Like that is a bad choice. But this. Yeah. Don't do that. Yeah. Yeah. Because you can feed Force of Vigor with this. So keep Force of Vigor. It's still the best removal for artifacts and enchantments in CDH and in Commander in general. Next, let's talk about these surveil lands. Now, I know we did a little bit of talking about them before when they were first spoiled, but in a more refined conversation, I think that these can contribute heavily to two color strategies, not to anything more than that. Because they're just two, like, I, I realized that, like, building decks these last few weeks, that I was looking at these, like, as an option to either one, feed the grave and work through cards. Or to have ready and available mana after fetching. And I nine times out of ten, I would much rather have the ready and available mana so I can continue 
pushing forward rather than like hoping that my deck, you know, like hoping that the top card of my deck uh, is worthy of being put in the grave or, or leaving on top. You know, it's uh, it's one of those things where two color decks do struggle with card choice and card advantage and being able to filter through some of those things. And it, the really the point of conversation that it piqued my interest with these was listening to Play to Win talk about them because they said, well, Cam specifically said that these surveillance for two color decks are going to feel like a time walk. It's not that good. <laughs> it's not that good. But you do get to see in index, like I know you can play the wondering whatever, but index that don't are uh, that are playing fetch lands. This is an option to say, hey, my hand. I just like my hand isn't great. I just need to know what next turn is going to look like so I can plan better. I'm not casting anything this turn. I don't need the mana this turn. I'm going to go fetch this, grab it, see it, decide whether or not it goes to the grave or not. You know, so it allows you some card selection for free or for one life that uh, will help you fix your colors moving forward. So that is my argument for them. Uh, respectfully disagree. Sure, but, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I just, I, I don't know. They just don't seem quite good enough. They seem like a trap, man. I, I think previously I was comparing them to the Temple Lands, and I, I still kind of feel that way. Yeah, they're fetchable temples. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. The, the, the and, big and thing... I, you know, even in two-color decks, I haven't had great experience playing the temples. It has always felt bad. Yeah. Whatever turn I play the temple on, it feels bad. Totally. The Like, unless it's turn one and you don't have a play, which if you're at playing at high power, if you're at your standard, like, local commander night, it's fine, right? That's fine. That's going to be a good play. You, get, you play a temple and you pass and pe people give you the thumbs up. But if you're playing at a tournament and you are trying to win playing this and you're not going to get any thumbs up. You're going to get a lot of weird looks around the table. And, uh, this, that's why I say like the only thing that pushes it above temples. Uh, and I, I, <laughs> I didn't say this before, but this is my opinion on it. The only thing that pushes this above temples is the ability to fetch it at instant speed. So, uh, someone wants to look at your top, you know, hits you with a ragavan. You can decide, you can look and see, you know, what they get and deny them that or something like that. Right. So there's, I mean, that, that seems super fringe. I, I think very, a, I think it's a net negative, no matter how many like fringe cases you put on it. Yeah. And if you are playing it, you're only playing one of them. Like for they, sure. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just for those very low percentage chances that, you know, you're sitting on a fetch and your opponent, you don't have a turn one play or you have a counter, here's here's the scenario <laughs> no well, well, no i mean for i'll make it simple the easiest thing like how good a land has to be to come into play tapped the bare minimum is the triomes and they have cycling and they're three colors and they have three basic land types on them yeah i this would be the scenario where i would see it as a good play is that you go first so the chances of you going first not high it's actually exactly 25 percent you play a fetch land. You have the one surveil land in your library. Goes to turn two. They are it goes to the second player. They don't do anything with their turn. You are holding a let's say you're holding a offer you can't refuse to stop a Mystic Remora or you know, whatever. But then so they don't do anything worth noting you to fetch a blue source to cast that. So it goes to the third third turn. They don't do anything either. Goes to the fourth player's turn. They cast a Ragavan and they are threatening to swing at you because they cast it for its dash cost. Then I can fetch, surveil, see what I have on top, decide whether or not to give it to them. That is the only case that it would be good. <laughs> that and is, that is such a thin scenario. That's like that never is gonna such happen. Like magical <laughs> Christmas land thinking. And like you're not even putting that towards winning the game or pulling off a cool combo. No. You're Putting that towards a defensive first turn play. Yeah, because if you're not going to play anything yeah. on your yeah, if you're not going to play anything yeah. on your first turn, like just go get the triumph. But I yeah. understand if you hold a fetch land because you want to stop a Mystic Remora or something. Like perfect, you have the interaction for it, Swan Song, whatever. Lovely, 
you know what? Whatever. I I just hope this conversation helps people down the path of deciding ultimately not to play these cards. We'll cycle back to this and yeah. say, I told you so. Okay, I'll accept it. I'll accept it if, if that happens. Like, no, and I'm saying we will be the ones saying, I told you so. Don't play, you know, these aren't <laughs> these aren't necessarily the greatest lands ever printed, nor do they deserve a slot in your CDH hyper-refined strategies. Got it. Got yeah. It. Uh, notably, there's a really cool piece of removal printed in this set that uh, it's called Assassin's Trophy. That might have a place in CDH. I uh, Yeah, uncounterable eliminate, right? Well, it it, it can be countered. Uh, Assassin's Trophy is just, uh, yeah, it's it's been around for a long time, but now it's... Oh, I was thinking, uh, sorry, I was thinking of a different card that we were about to talk about. Oh, yeah, we will. Sorry, I just uh, thought I'd make a little joke. <laughs> yeah, I missed it. I missed it. Sorry. All right. Now we're talking about that card. There's a new card. It's called Long Goodbye. Take it away, Ritter. I already said what it does. Oh, yeah. So, um, cost one and a black. Yeah, uh, colorless and a black. Instant the spell can't be countered. Destroy target creature or planeswalker with mana value three or less. Whoa. That first I line. I think that's of, pretty good. Yeah. That first yeah. line of text, I think, is probably the most relevant one. Uh, notably. When you really, really want to remove a creature or planeswalker, play this. Yeah. There aren't many effects in the game that are like you gain protection from you know this or you gain hex proof or you know like even instant speed ward is hard to come by a lot of the creatures that we invest in as cdh players or even playing at high power is something that is already stapled to the card so um mana value three or less you aren't like as we stray into this territory of mid-range becoming king like this becomes weaker. I think that it what it does is it kills a Kinnon unconditionally. Like that is probably the best case scenario, or a Thrasios, or even a Timna. Like there are definitely worthy commanders that are seen in like heavily in heavy concentrations at tournament. Those cards are probably your most common commanders. You are seeing Timna, Thrasios. Kinnon, full stop, those are the top three. And like th th there's other targets, obviously, but I think that just because this hits them and they're not allowed to interact with it in really any way or counter it to stop them from stop you from removing their commander, it's worth it's worth at least testing to see what whether or not this can be you know, find a slot in your list. Yeah. I give it a shot, man. I, yeah. I feel like it's a, a pretty good card. Maybe not necessarily in CDH, but in other formats, it's going to see some uh, see some play. Oh, dude, yeah. I think this is going to uh, be modern. Maybe modern. Uh, definitely Pioneer. And then definitely Standard. As we see, like, go for the throat cycle out. I think that finally rotates out. I might be wrong, but uh, this is going to replace a few, a few of those things. All right. The last card we're going to talk about today, which is a, our, a card that we've had a little discussion on, and I think a lot of people are having discussion on, determining whether or not it's good enough. Good enough. We have Crime Novelist. Take it away, Ritter. Uh, crime Novelist? Sure. I actually closed the Mythic, mythic Spoiler page, so correct me if I'm wrong. Two and a colorless. Uh, sorry, two colorless and a red. It's a goblin. I don't know its stats stat line, but anytime you cast a incident or sorcery, or is it a red spell? No, nah, I got you. I'll take it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sorry, man. I closed out the page. I was like, I know what this card is all about. Yeah. I forgot that. Yeah. This is two and a red, a one three goblin bard called Crime Novelist. Whenever you sacrifice an artifact, put a plus one plus one counter on Crime Novelist and add a red mana. I was I was not very close. You were close enough. Yeah. <laughs> you got the name <laughs> and the mana value and the typing. Yeah. So well, you know that's something. This card has an effect. It uh it does things, and I think that we see that this card has potential. Heavy out the gate, uh, you know a lot of these cards, and I think as it comes with every set, you want to 
play these cards to see if they are viable and contribute to your overall strategy. This one, I think that's what we're going to see. It's a, probably a 4 out of 10 for me on the power scale of, in CDH. Yeah, because I'm thinking, when are you typically going to sacrifice an artifact? You know, and there's one artifact that we all generally sacrifice, and that's just a treasure. Like, yeah, and and so what you're what's going to happen is you're going to get an additional red mana. Um, but if you're sacrificing treasures, typically, or or you know, if you're in CDH and you're messing around with treasures, typically you have a way to amass a lot of them already. And I don't think this card is adding efficiency to like your your ramping. Right. It, it's there's a couple things that I was key like key scenarios that I would say this becomes playable. And that is if you are using an invasion of Ikoria and your goal is to loop Dockside. Right. You have one of the pieces. You don't have enough like artifacts and enchantments on the battlefield, but Crime Novelist is going to give you double the mana for each treasure you crack so it shortens the uh it well it reduces the effort you have to put into dockside loops so uh delny notably is a human so you're not able to fetch it out with certain uh tutors and this is also this this will allow you to do that now i am a weathered uh shalai and halar player but i've always been heavy on stacks and basically restricting other players access to artifacts so if i were to switch that build to be more in line with uh like docs using dockside and it being explosive and going for like the win as fast as possible instead of setting up my particular scenario this would be helpful because i would just have to sacrifice one artifact to get the shalai and alar trigger and i would win through a dockside loop rather than winning through uh, the Red Terror or through uh, Heliod. So that's a very, that's it's a very like particular deck that you have to build and Shalai and Halar is it, but I feel like every other deck is not going to want this. They're going to find different ways to do Dockside shenanigans. Yeah, I, I think you said it was a 4 out of 10. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm there with you. Yeah, like most things have to probably register as a seven or higher to consider general play. And this is just being lower than a five requires a very like you, you almost have to build around it. And when you go for the win, this has to be a part of that win condition. Otherwise it's not playable. So those are my feelings on that. Mm -hmm. I think it's, there are plenty of cards from this set. Like I think that are playable, and will contribute to the meta and the scene in CDH. How long they contribute to it with how many sets we see will be is unforeseen. But it's exciting right now in the moment. As Americans listening to this, you know better than anyone. Our attention spans are super short. So let's have fun while we can and enjoy these cards while they're fresh and new. Go out, build yourself an Anzrag, the Quake Mole. Build yourself a Delany deck. Figure out what you want to do with uh, with your deck and your life, and here we go. That's it. <laughs> That's the episode. <laughs> you have any closing? You have any closing comments, Ritter? <laughs> I got another man. You hit it. Yeah. This has been another episode of the Mock Stars podcast. I had a great time today, Ritter. How about you? Best time of my life. Woo! We really kick some ass. Let's get the heck out of here. If you want to support the show, find us on YouTube. You can also find us on all major podcasting platforms. Make sure you get out there and share this with your friends, with your community. That's the number one way to help the channel grow. And stay tuned for more Mock Stars content as we continue to churn it out. Videos every Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And we're doing a little TikTok action on Sundays as well. So make sure you get on there and subscribe and check out my super funny sense of humor. I made a Family Guy meme this week. Oh, good for you. Yeah, it was really funny. I only got 300 views. Like, what the heck? This is funny. 300 people think I'm funny. All right. Peace. We're out. Peace. Deuces.